presents Spooky South Ghost with your hosts, Tim Watt. Good evening and welcome to Spooky South Coast. Tim Weisberg here, along with the silent assassin Matt Costa and science advisor Matt Moniz broadcasting on WBSM and also broadcasting on Spooky TV at SpookySouthCoast.com. So if you're listening at home, jump into the chat room there at Spooky TV and you can actually join in the chat. we got a bunch of people in there already and uh, it's only going to grow as the night progresses. So, And I think there's going to be a lot of side conversations going on in the chat room tonight for sure because we've got quite the show lined up. Uh, joining us in just a few minutes will be Tom Biscardi, the Bigfoot hunter and... Uh, we talked about Tom a few years ago mm-hmm. <laughs> when there was a, a uh, very controversial uh, Bigfoot finding by two gentlemen from Georgia, and Tom got involved with them, and now he's promoting his new film, Anatomy of a Bigfoot Hoax. So you can gather pretty much just from that little bit of information what went down, but Tom's going to give us the inside story of what happened, and uh, right off the top of the bat, uh, we'll say that we were skeptical when that happened, and you know we... <laughs> we certainly weren't ready to buy into it just yet, but Matt Moniz, uh, being a, a longtime researcher into all things cryptid, uh, especially raised the flag. So I made it a point to actually call Tom himself and ask if we could uh, somehow get involved in this. And then later on, the news came out, and we all yes. learned. So uh, you know, we'll we'll get deep into the story, and of course, the phone lines will be open for you all night long as well. One eight seven seven nine nine six fourteen twenty or 508-996-0500 for local calls. You can also email us, SpookyCrew, at SpookySouthCoast.com as well. So let's get right into it. Tom Biscardi began his Bigfoot research in 1967. Uh, His first company relating to Bigfoot research was Amazing Horizons Corporation in 1971. And uh, he was, quote, the founder and expedition leader of the principal company responsible for the existence and documentation on the legendary creature Bigfoot. He's also the host of the Bigfoot Live radio show, which is uh, located at BigfootLive.com, and also his website is searchingforbigfoot.com, and he joins us on the line now. Good evening, Tom. How are you? Welcome to Spooky South Coast. Hey, how you doing, guys? Oh, we are spooktacular, as we say here. Okay. <laughs> so l- let me ask you this, Tom. Uh, I've, I've been on your website numerous times over the years. I've heard you on many different shows, and I'm interested in how you got involved in Bigfoot research because I think a lot of people's first exposure to the idea of Bigfoot is somewhat similar to how you came about it. That's very true. Am I, am I speaking with uh, Tim right now? Yes, I'm Tim, and uh, then you'll hear, if anybody else talks in the room, either one of them is Matt because both my co-hosts are named Matt. Okay, Tim. Yeah, I was. Uh, it all started back in 1967. And uh, I was working for Lockheed at the time, and I was working on a swing shift. That, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's from 3 until 11 in the afternoon tonight. And uh, I had quit one day, got off my shift, and uh, I got home. I opened up a beer, sat down on my easy chair, and here I'm watching a Johnny Carson show, and guess who was on? It was uh, Roger Patterson showing his famous uh, film that he had taken up in Bluff Creek. And I was just totally drawn back, couldn't believe that here they've got this monkey-type guy out there and nobody can find the damn thing. So I went to the library the next day and uh, found everything I could find out about Bigfoot. And uh, I was kind of lucky. Well, as I uh, uh, contacted all these people who were looking for, for the creature at the time, and everybody at that time all steered me to one guy named Ivan Marks up in Bernie, California. Well, I contacted him, and and, uh, I went up to see him. Unusual type character. Here's a guy that uh, lived on 40 acres up in Bernie, California, and he was like the Yule Gibbons type. I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember who Yule Gibbons was. 
No. He was a, a naturalist, a guy that would go out on a trail, and if you were hungry, he took off a piece of bark and said, here, eat it, and sub, you know, sub, subsidized your, your hunger pangs for a while. Nevertheless, uh, I got to know the man, and I had to live with him for 30 days. Now here, a guy coming from Brooklyn, New York, you got to understand that one of the things that I knew that was great was a park. Everything was concrete or cement. And uh, never knew anything about drawing my own water from a pump, because that's what he had at the time. Uh, never knew how to take a gun or a, or a bow and arrow and go out and get the meat for the night or for the week or for the month and how to grow my own provisions and things like that. I learned all this stuff from, from Ivan Marks and Peggy Marks. I learned how to, 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 to eat off the land. I learned how to, to uh, track animals of all sort. And uh, I had to live with him, gave his confidence, and he was a recluse, believe it or not. No matter what everybody else out there says about Ivan Marks, you know, there's the old adage, fellas, that, you know, don't condemn anybody until you walk in their shoes for a while. Mm -hmm. well, I walked in this man's shoes for more than a month, but I got to know him in that one month pretty well. I learned how to hunt bear, how to uh, deer and, and cougar and possum and everything. Everything, you name it, we, we did it, okay? This was his job. This is what he did for a living. Now, here's the interesting part about that whole thing. All the main big guys in the Bigfoot field back then all hired Ivan Marks, Peter Byrne, Lowell Thomas, Walt Disney, all the big names, okay? And why? Because he was a man of the woods. He was a man that, that knew how to track, especially these creatures, because his story goes back to the late 40s, early 50s, where he had his encounters he was a game warden up there in Alaska, where they call the creature the Bushman up there. And he had quite a few encounters himself up, up in, in that region. So my, my, my study and my research started with him, in which I was turned on to him from all the big guys searching for, for Bigfoot. Well, I was, I was honored, to be honest, you know, with you guys. And then... You know, everybody says, oh, I marks the hoaxer, Ivan marks this and Ivan marks that. <clears throat> they didn't know the man. But anything that was out there and everything, anything that was happening was because of Ivan marks. And uh, that's how I got started. And, yeah. and from there, uh, you, you know, once you realize what went into tracking such a creature and when you found out, you know, that it was more than just, you know, they didn't just come right out to you when you went out there looking for them. Exactly. Okay. I mean, uh, I've come a long way, fellas. Let me tell you something. From the days that I started with a flashlight and a sharp stick compared to a thermal imager and the heat seekers and, and the flare devices that we use today. And not only that, uh, we, we've been blessed. And i got to tell you, uh, we've networked and the synergy that we've got throughout the country where people are calling us some of them daily basis where before maybe if we got one or two calls every three months it was a lot but uh, because we have tentacles of, of researchers that are connected with us all over the globe now so therefore that uh, makes our job a lot easier and when I say that I, and I mean it in a good way that uh, don't, don't, don't think that everybody who's in this field we're all, uh, well, let's say. <laughs> oh, we know. Yeah. yeah you, you know what I'm saying? It, it, because a lot of them, you know, they've got a lot of free time on their, on their hands. And some of them, the elevators don't go to the top. But at the same point in time, when you know that you got yourself a school teacher or uh, an engineer or a scientist, or a nurse or a doctor or uh, a mayor of a city, and he complies with all the standards of what we're looking for, he has a sighting, uh, you know you've got a substantial encounter there. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's something that you probably had to deal with uh, over the last 30-plus years is figuring out, you know, which reports are worth 
chasing after and which ones are, are you know, which ones seem on the surface like they could just be easily explainable? Without a doubt, uh, Tim. And uh, let me tell you something. I don't know it all, okay? I learn every day. There's not a day that goes by that I don't learn something new. Uh, I was like, like with the anatomy of Bigfoot hoax. Who would have ever thought, guys, think about this just for a second. Who would have ever thought? Here are two officers, okay, officers of the law, one that was a decorated uh, uh, officer that took one for the team. He got wounded in pursuit of a felon. And the other guy was a correctional officer. So these guys were pretty savvy. They were pretty, uh, hey, they're upstanding citizens, let's say, okay? And the thing that really bothered me about that whole thing was that all the people in the cryptid world, and I'm talking about from A to Z, I'm not going to leave anybody out. I'm talking about the Meldrums. I'm talking about the, uh, uh, what's that clown's name, uh, the guy up in Maine. Whoa, whoa, uh, come yeah. on. <laughs> what? What's his name? We know, we know who you mean, yes, but uh, he's yeah, 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 yeah. Good, good friend okay. of ours. Well, God bless you. And, and, and you know what? God bless him. But you don't know the story. You know, he's the one that was calling, busting my balls on a daily basis while this whole thing was going on. Tom, um, look for this, look for that. Make sure I get the pictures first, Tom, okay? Can you help me out for there before anybody else scoops the story? Lorne Coleman. There, you're right. That's his name. Okay? Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, while, while these guys were thrashing him and all that stuff, I, I never badmouthed him or anybody else at the time after I found out all the stuff that was going on. But you've got to understand, you know, all the big guys, all the big guns, including Moneymaker, and all those other clowns that were out there, okay? They all wanted to get in on this deal to find out, was it really true, okay? Because I'll tell you what, they had everybody upside down there for a month. And uh, this, your, one of your cohorts right there, Matt, said that he called me. I don't remember. Did you talk to me, Matt? Talked to you directly. Offered you a DNA sequencer and a bunch of analytical chemistry instruments. Okay, and what did I say? Uh, if you can bring them on down here, go ahead. Okay. All right. Well, then if we had that conversation, uh, I'm sure we did then. And, and I've always accepted stuff from everybody, okay? And, it, and, and I've never, never denied anybody to come in, contrary to what you read on the Internet. You know, you, well, like I, mean, I said. I was going to say, sure, too. If somebody's offering you the use of a DNA sequencer over having to pay somebody else <laughs> to use theirs, yeah, sure, why wouldn't you accept their help? Uh, and, and I did, and I, and I, and I did accept it. Till that other woman who was the, uh, oh, I forget her name. I, you know, how quick we forget when you find out that they're not really the people they are. But nevertheless, uh, she's in the, in the cryptid world, too. She's an archaeologist, I think. She turned me on to Kurt Nelson. Of course, Kurt Nelson was doing the stuff for Monster Quest. And they all said, oh, you guys, you better use him. So I used him, and it cost me twelve hundred dollars. Okay, twelve hundred dollars, and and none of these people do anything for nothing now. Remember that, fellas. Okay, but remember when when Biscardi's in the business? Oh, Biscardi's only in this business to make money. First of all, I never told anybody I wasn't in business not to make money. Okay. Second of all, I, I this is my job. I employ people to work with me. They get paid, guys. Okay. They have families that they have to support, you know, and have a roof over their head, clothes on their backs, and food in their stomachs. And if they're not out there doing with me, they have to have a regular job somewhere else. So well, I've never ever told anybody that I was in this business not to make money. And, and I just want to interrupt you for a second there, Tom, because this is something that I've heard is a criticism that's often leveled at you in your work, and that's that Searching for Bigfoot Incorporated is an entertainment company that – you know, you're in the pro, in the in the business of making films, and you're in the business of you know bringing people out on Bigfoot hunts and, and the different things that you do there. And I personally, I don't see a problem with that because a, a lot of your critics say, well, you know, it should be about the research. It should be about the research. We all know there's no money in the research for this. There's no way to sustain your ability to hunt for this creature 
based on looking for research money. So by having an entertainment company, in which way you can kind of get your name out there as a Bigfoot researcher and also be able to afford to get yourself to where these locations are, I don't, I don't see a problem with that. Well, I appreciate you know, your, your, your thought on this. First of all, it's, we're not an entertainment company. Okay? I don't know where you got that from. Well, I mean, that's, that's, that's what the criticism problem. is against you. Okay, yeah. But that's okay. You know, I, I don't care. That, that doesn't pay my bills, nor does it pay my crew's bills, okay? The key to it is, is we, we are legitimate Bigfoot researchers. We're out there on real encounters uh, all over this country. We're, we're probably the only Bigfoot researchers that log in excess of 140,000 miles per year, guys, okay? And that's straight fact. I don't care where you hear your information, you're getting it from me right now, okay? Mm -hmm. um, we, we document everything that we do. There's people out there that can't get their research out. So they call me and they say, hey, Tom, you're a public person. You've got some kind of celebrityism. Could you help me? There's not one person I have not helped. There is not one organization that has asked for my help that I have not helped that I have not given money to, to, to help them uh, stay alive and keep their research going. There's organizations that are out there that have asked me to help them with uh, materialistic items, uh, heat seekers, uh, night scopes, things of that nature. And I've done that for them, okay, knowing that, hey, maybe they can, you help others and they'll help you. And that's all I've done. So... Because I had the, the intuitiveness of taking a, a videographer with me wherever we had gone to investigate our encounters and film it all and get releases from people, oh, this party's in the entertainment business now. Mm -hmm. well, I'm not in the entertainment business, but I want the world to, to, sh to see what we've found and what we've uncovered, okay? And it's I just like the skeleton or the hand. The hand was given to me by Don Monroe, who in which the Butte, Montana Police Department gave it to him because after they the, the DNA on it, it came back that it wasn't human, wasn't a bear. So now they said, hey, since you're out there, this could be a Bigfoot, could you find out about it? Well, he went out for four years and couldn't get anybody to come, come across and tell him what it was. <clears throat> so he handed it off to me in Montana, in which you saw what I did with it. And any of your people or your listeners out there who've seen the uh, Bigfoot lives, it's in that movie, okay? And all we've done, Tim and, and crew is, and listeners, is just document everything that we've done, whether it be in upstate New York, Florida, Ohio, uh, Illinois, Alabama, Georgia, Kentucky, uh, Oregon, Washington, Minnesota, Michigan, all over the country. We've documented it all, okay? So then at the same point in time, I put it together as a documentary or a docudrama, okay? And I might add, you know, those who've seen Bigfoot Lives, this movie's been hailed as, as the most authoritative Bigfoot documentary out there, outside the, the, the uh, Ph.D. world and scientist world, where the common guy, you and I, had an encounter that we could sit and talk about it and tell it and, and discuss it our way. And by the way, that movie has won Best Documentary in the Pocono Mountains Film Festival and Best Director. So that's, I just want to clear that, that part up, Tim and guys. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a movie maker, okay? I'm, I'm not a movie company. I'm just a guy that wants to take what we found out there and share it with the world. And the, the advantage of doing that, the advantage of having uh, a film, uh, you know, whether it be an entire film crew or at least just one videographer with you, is it's another resource when you're out there conducting this investigation. I mean, what should happen? Should Bigfoot walk right in front of you when you're out there looking for him? You know, now you have a professional camera person, somebody who this is their job, and when they capture the video, it's, a lot, it's subject to a lot less scrutiny when you have a professional behind the camera. You know, I hope your listeners are listening to you very closely. 
You are. I've never met you before. I've never talked to you before. You are probably one of the most intelligent guys I've spoken to while I've been in this industry for the last 30 some odd years. Okay? Well, thank I don't you know. For that. No, I'm being honest because I couldn't have put it any better than you did, Tim. Okay? And, and you, you've got the intuitiveness to put two and two together to make four. Okay? You're exactly right. Okay? Who better could document this thing or catch, capture one of these things on film than a real videographer? I'm not a cameraman. Okay? I'm a common guy that's got an interest and got a belief that I had a sighting myself and I wanted to make sure that this thing was real or a bunch of crap. And I'll tell you what, fellas, uh, I've had six encounters in my more than 30-year tenure in this, in this industry. All my guys who have come out with me have had encounters one way or another, whether it be visual or remnants that has been left by these creatures, saw footprints or, or had vocalizations or what have you. And, and you can ask any of my guys, okay? And, and they'll, they'll tell you the truth about Tom Biscardi, okay? There's so much hype out there. I, I don't even go to it anymore. I don't need to. Mm-hmm. But I know the truth as well as the people who know me, okay? And it's just like, and I just want to get back to this anatomy of the Bigfoot hoax real quickly again. You know, all these guys out in the field, all these so-called Bigfoot researchers, hunters, that in the cryptid world, man, they wanted to all know, every one of them, okay? But how many of them had the cojones to get out there and make it happen, okay? And had the money and resources to make it happen. Well, apparently there was only one that I know of, guys, and it was me. Mm-hmm. When they had gone and said, hey, and it wasn't even me, okay? I, I was listening to it, and you know, people all over the country said, hey, Tom, you better find out what's going on here, man. This, this stuff's starting to look legit. They're being pretty damn cocky. And I said, that's ah, all crap. It's all crap. It's all crap. Then it got to the pulse of the major players in the industry. But for some reason or another, we couldn't get to these guys. So one of the other guys called me up and said, hey, Pop, they want you on the, to come see this thing. Because he had him on his show. So I said, let me get him on the show and we'll talk. So they came on my show, and those of you who saw the Anatomy of Bigfoot Oaks, and if you don't have a copy, uh, Tim, I'll make sure that Jim sends you one. Thank you. Uh, he, uh, they invited me out that Saturday. It was Wednesday when they were on my show. So, you know, Tom Biscardi, he's inquisitive as hell, and you bet I'll come. When I went out there, first of all, my plane was a couple, three hours late because it was a big rainstorm. And I thought to myself, oh, my God, what happens if I get there and these guys aren't even there? I got no address. I just got a cell phone number, you know? Mm-hmm. I landed, getting off, get my baggage, and here they, the both of them are there. Well, so far, so good. They're, they're guys of their word, you know. And then they, they took care of me. That's the thing I, I, I couldn't understand. I'm saying to myself, wow, these guys are pretty straight up. So now my thinking is going, hey, they're cops. One's decorated. Got his arm in a sling and a cast. Uh... He's a hero. He took one for the team. The other one was a correctional officer. Not there anymore, but he had a tow truck company or a car company, whatever he was selling. They, they, they looked out for my well-being that night. They didn't want me to stay at the wrong side of town. They said, hey, come on this side of town. We'll feel better. That You know, it's a, a decent, it was a Hampton Inn or something, I think it was. And they said, you rest tonight, and then tomorrow we'll come by and we'll talk. Well, they did everything that they said they would do, and we talked. And I told them, I said, you know, I said, I want you to feel comfortable as I want to be comfortable with you. I think we have to have something down on paper. We have to have a contract here. You guys wanted me to come out here. I'm here. It's on my dime, not yours. And I says, what do you want from me? And they told me straight up, and it's in paper, in contract Form. I have the contract and signed by the three of us that I'm, I'm here for one thing. And by the way, 
they were to receive 75% of all proceeds and me 25%. I was to handle all publicity, all management of the, uh, of the scientific uh, part when they diagnose, when they dissect the body, and the whole nine yards. I had full charge of all that. I even contacted the, uh, the scientists that we were going to use and, uh, and they insisted that they wanted to have it in the, in the safe house, which I had up in Indiana with Bill Lett. Took care of all that stuff. And then, announced to me, uh, they said, I'm going to bring your swatch from the body, and I want you to take it, and you go get the DNA. And I never even asked unsolicited. They gave me that swatch. And I called my son, TJ. Had him come down, and I called uh, Chuck Creel and Greg Worthington. They came out from Alabama, came out from Kentucky, all of them. And they saw it. They were all there with me. And I told them, I said, you hand carry this thing. I don't want to send it by mail or delivery service. You hand carry it to Bill Lett, and uh, Bill will take it up to Minnesota to Kurt Nelson, which they did. And then the guys had told me, okay, we'll sign this contract, and you come back here the following week, and we'll show you the body. And I agreed. So I left, and, and in the interim, now I'm getting these reports from Kurt Nelson. Everybody has seen what the, uh, the DNA came back as. First DNA, uh, I forget what the hell they call that thing, uh, sequencing came back as, as part human, part um, primate. And I says, well, is that a good thing? He says, well, it's, it's encouraging, Tom. Now, this is coming from Kurt Nelson. I, I'm thinking it's pretty good, you know. So anything that was sent to me, I put it out to everybody, and they all saw what I got. Well, next thing you know, I'm, time for me to get back out there to Georgia. And this was the big day that I was going to get to see the body. That whole day, they wouldn't let me go see the body due to the fact that there was a church in front where they were storing this thing under a canopy lean-to type thing of a part of a house in a freezer. And they says that there was too many inquisitive people in the church because they were making a lot of stops in and out. They wanted to wait until the church was over. They said, we'll go around 11 o'clock. So during that day, I said, well, why don't you take me to the area where you guys got this creature? Announced to me, knowing it's four hours drive each way. We had time to kill anyway, so what the hell? So they took me to the area, <coughs> and uh, at that point in time, they showed me these photos of others. Supposedly, there was more than one creature. And uh, one of them walking, which I'm sure that's out there, out there somewhere. And, and then one that was actually had fallen, that supposedly they shot. And uh, I took pictures with them, of course, and then we made our trek all the way back. Now, you got to understand, they were zigzagging, and they were doing 60, 70 miles an hour in residential areas that speed limits were only... 30 to 35 miles an hour, trying to turn me off that I couldn't uh, know the areas where they were going. Well, the church had already let out, and we're getting out. He turns his lights off. He's going down this corridor to the house in the back of the church. And he stops, and all of a sudden, this guy from the side window puts an Uzi in my face. Who are you? Who are you? What do you want? And these guys said, it's okay. He's with us. You got to understand, my life is just going through my, through, through my, through my whole vision just went through my whole sure, yeah. brain at the time, saying, "What the hell am I doing here, man? I mean, nobody knows where I'm at. Uh, I could be buried, and, and uh, nobody could find my body for the next million years." You know? I, don't th I don't think you'd be the first out there to have that happen. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Okay. So now we get out of the car, and uh, there's a uh, like. Uh, mechanics light that's hanging over a limb and the bulb wouldn't work apparently okay so i had a little 
small flashlight, and they open the freezer. Now, the whole thing is frozen over with ice on top, except the parts of the face, the tongue, the teeth, the eyes, I could touch and feel, knowing that it wasn't plastic, it wasn't phony, they were real. And the parts of the intestine, and I says, is that where you got the swatch? They said, yeah, because I saw the cut piece there. And I asked them, I says, well, why is it that the intestines are out? I says, did, were you guys shot the thing? Was it shoot it in the stomach area? And, and because of the pressure of the ice and the gases of the intestines, did it push it through the hole? And they says, well, we're not a doctor or anything, but we think that's what happened. And then they closed the top real quick. So at that time, they take me back to the to the hotel, and they said, look, Tom, here's the deal. Uh, you know, we've been offered a lot of money for this thing from the Inquirer and everything else, and we want to work with you, and we want to do this thing the right way. And I said, okay. And they said, but, you know, you could take this body. We'll never see you again. We'll never get a dime from you. And you show some good faith to us and give us 50000 in cash. So I thought it was a reasonable deal. I said, okay, fine, I'll do that. Wait, wait, wait. You, th you thought that was a reasonable deal? Yeah, I did. I mean, yeah, I here, here it is. You're, you're coming here, and I'm assuming, I mean, not to put words in your mouth here, but I'm assuming that you, you assume that they want you to come in because of your ability to connect them into the research network and to help them you know, get things done, such as DNA testing. Uh, and also because if they, when they do take this public... You do have uh, experience in uh, in the promotion of things like this, uh, but here they are saying to you, you know, you gotta wait, you gotta see, you know, we're gonna take you to see it, and then they make you wait to go see it. And, but the whole time, it seemed like they were on the up and up to this point. I mean, there was nothing in the back of your mind that said, "Wait, did they bring me out here just to get money from me?" No, no. And of course, here's the reason why. And listen to me closely. Mm -hmm. I know if I had the body. 50000 is a mere pittance when I know what the body is worth. Oh, true. Okay. Let's be real, okay? But they were so sincere, and we had a contract, and I didn't own it. I got 25%. I told mm -hmm. you that. They yep. own 75% of it. They even, and, and we even discussed, you know, the, uh, you know, when I, because when I touch the eyes and the ears, I'm not the eyes, the, the eyes, the teeth, and the tongue, and the intestines, and I prodded the bones part. It was real what I had touched, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm thinking to myself, you know, if it was me, I wouldn't release the body for $20 million, okay? But I'm Tom Biscardi, and I've been through the situation when it comes to money in this industry, okay? I know a little bit different, more so, than, than the average Joe. I'm a businessman. But here's the deal. And I told him, okay, here's what I want you to do. I says, I'll get the safe house. I'll get the scientific team ready. I says, I'll set up the, uh, uh, the press conference. I says, but we got to wait until I get the finalization done from Kurt Nelson. And they said, look, Tom, we're going to transfer this body to you, to your team. You're going to have possession of it. We may never see you again, okay? Now, here's the deal. We'll take the 50000 okay? Just show goodwill to us, okay? And then we'll release it to you. I says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to make sure that you have this body defrosted. My team will be out there on Thursday. I'll give you the 50000 in cash. But you make sure it's defrosted where they can make sure they, they touch and feel the hands and, and the feet. That was my... Matter of fact... Warren Coleman told me the day before, make sure you have that the, that the hands and the, and the feet are touched by the crew, that they're real, okay? And, uh, and they agreed, okay? Now, my guys get out there, and all hell breaks loose. There's helicopters hoovering over. They're going 60, 80 miles an hour in residential areas. They got guns thrown in their faces. I don't know if they had blindfolds put on them. 
you, uh, it was like a, a, a scene right out of a, a, a movie, for crying out loud. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing that blows my mind, is and they're there, okay? And I told my guys, I told Bob, and I told the other Bob, and I told uh, Bill Lett, do not give them the money unless you actually see what I saw and feel the hands and the feet, okay, and make sure it's defrosted. Well, they got out there, and, and, and because of all the cops and the media and, and everybody trying to chase them down, and helicopters moving up and guns being put in their faces, they got nervous up. Simple as that. So I told them, I said, make sure you touch the hands and the feet and make sure they're real. So I get a call from, from Bill Lett, and Bill says to me, Tom, you know, we saw the thing that you saw in the picture, but we can't get to this, to the feet and the, and the hands. Well, it's in a, a, in a 1,500 pound block of ice. I said, well, listen, I told, told, told those guys to have make sure that thing was defrosted. He says, well, they're not, but I feel reasonable that we've got the real deal here. I said, are you sure? Okay. And they said to me, yes. Well, have you seen the movie yet, by the way, Tim? I have not, no. You need to see this, okay, because thank God I had my videographer there, and he courted it all. And film don't lie, gentlemen. Remember that. What you see is what you get. Well, we, we've got about five minutes here uh, before we have to take a break for the news. Uh, but was there any thought that went through your mind? I mean, I know you're wrapped up in the excitement of, wh of what's going on, and you think that, you know, from what you've seen, everything looks legit. Was there ever any thought in your mind to maybe tell them if they wanted that fifty grand, they had to put it into, like, an escrow account, or they had to put it aside until you could undeniably prove that this thing was legit before they could actually have access to those funds? That's a great question. But in the spur of the moment, in the excitement, I didn't think of that. And, and the person that I, I let go there with the cash was a guy that's a lot smarter than I am when it comes to finances. And he got caught up into the hoopla just like I did or anybody else would have. Sure. Okay? I mean, I'm just trying to make sure that it wasn't that it was your excitement and not that you did propose it and they were against it. Now, listen, remember one thing. I'm, I'm 2,500 miles away in, 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 in California setting up. The, uh, the news conference for the next day. And then I'm worrying to myself, you know, after we give this guy, uh, these guys, the 50000 in cash, and my guys get the body, they have to show up the next morning, okay? And that was another thing that baffled the hell out of me. Here it is, the transaction goes down that Thursday. My guys are pumped beat hell. I mean, they were just riding on high. Mm -hmm. They they make the exchange. Now they're on their way to Indiana to the safe house. They call me up. Hey, Pop, we got it. Looks good. Everything is, you know, A-OK. -okay. And uh, I said, OK, fine. I said, and now I'm worried about are these guys going to show up for the press conference on Friday, which is the next day, 12 hours later. Well, uh, that was the biggest part of this whole little ordeal for me at this point in time. The next morning, I, I get out there at uh, 7.20 in the morning in San Francisco, and here they are. I said, oh, my God, it's all true, every bit of it. Because if it wasn't, why would they flown out here? Yeah, why would they put themselves into that? situation to perpetrate. I mean, to me, it was unbelievable to begin with in the back of my mind that somebody would even try to perpetrate a hoax in this day and age. Uh, so, I mean, if you're standing up there on the stage with them, at that point, you must be thinking, okay, now, you know, nobody would risk their reputation like this. Wait a minute. We didn't even get there yet. And then that's the next part. Maybe you want to do it on the side of your commercial, but uh, I'll tell you right now, when they showed up at the airport, Wow, I wiped my brow, and I said, thank you, Jesus, okay? And I said, the whole thing, is a, it's, it's all true. It's all real. They get into my rig. I take them to the hotel. 
Uh, I told them that we're going to have the press conference and announced to me, my God, there was 228 media people there, and they were streaming it live from all over the world, Phyllis, all over, China, Australia, uh, Germany, uh, Japan, England. They were all there, okay? I remember some sites shut down. I was trying to watch it live, and some of the, the sites couldn't handle the traffic. Exactly, and, and you know what they called it? They called it Black Bigfoot Friday to show you how incredible the impact Bigfoot is around the world. And all those sites were all shut down because of the so many people all over the world trying to get on and find out what was going on. Well, we have to take a break here for the news. Like I said, when we come back on the other side, we'll jump back into it, you know, chronologically of what happened next. And, and we'll talk about what went down when, when everything kind of came to the surface here. And I mean, I'm just fascinated to hear this inside version of the story because I remember when the story first broke, we were in here talking about it, and never in my mind did it occur that if there was a hoax going on, and no offense to you, but I couldn't think you could be that close to it and not know what was going on. So uh, I'm just fascinated to, to find out more of this story, and we'll get more into it uh, coming up in hour number two of the program. If you want to call in during that time, you can call us up at one eight seven seven nine nine six fourteen twenty or 508-996-0500. We'll be back after the news with more with Tom Biscardi. In the meantime, you can go to his websites, and if you go to searchingforbigfoot.com or bigfootlive.com, you'll be able to purchase the DVD for yourself of Anatomy of a Bigfoot Hoax. And, and from what we're hearing from Tom, you have to see the film in order to understand the whole story. So go on the websites during the news break. And when we come back, we're going to talk just for a couple of minutes, Tom. We'll put you on. We'll, we'll call you back in a few minutes because we're going to talk to Chris Balzano about an upcoming promotion we have uh, here at Spooky South Coast. And then we'll get right back into the Bigfoot talk. So stay tuned for more here on Spooky South Coast. First, with local news, talk, and sports, this is WBSM New Bedford, Citadel Broadcasting, AM 1420, WBSM. From ABC News, I'm Chuck Sievertson. Six nuclear plant reactors are in very big trouble, damaged by the earthquake and tsunami in northeast Japan. Joe Sincerione, author of several books on nuclear issues. This is an extremely serious situation, and we're not out of the woods yet. And we get the latest live from Tokyo and ABC's Alex Stone. Chuck, it now appears it could be a worst-case scenario here. Japan's cabinet ministry secretary saying through a translator moments ago a partial meltdown of that second power plant is likely underway right now. We are also assuming uh, the possibility of a meltdown as we carry out measures. Already we're getting reports of radiation exposure north of here. The rescue effort goes on. Fires are still burning in some towns. Cars are still floating in waters. Debris is covering every inch in those areas. And we've been feeling the aftershocks, which continue. Chuck? Live from Tokyo, ABC's Alex Stone. There was an explosion at one reactor earlier today with evacuations 13 miles around that area, some people being tested for radiation sickness. ABC's Christiana Amanpour in Tokyo. Quite clearly, this is the worst nuclear accident in Japanese history, and it may shape up to be one of the worst in the world ever. The Prime Minister of Japan went on television and urged calm, saying that the utmost priority for the nation is the safety of those people within the radiation zone. Cranes have hauled up sunken boats hit by the waves yesterday that crashed into the harbor at Santa Cruz, California. Waves triggered by the Japan quake Estimated damage to the harbor, $17.5 million. North of there at Crescent City, the only other harbor sustaining wave damage, the early estimate is $50 million. Officials tell ABC News the driver of that bus that crashed early today on I-95 just north of New York City might have fallen asleep behind the wheel and lost control. 14 people were killed, 19 others hurt. The investigation continues. At 2 a.m. local time in most areas of the U.S., standard time ends and clocks are moved ahead one hour for daylight savings time. Saving time, and you're listening to ABC News. Live from Progressive. Welcome to Truck Talk. We're on with Ed. Hi, Flo. Is it true that you're the number one truck insurer? That's a big 10 4. More truckers choose us than any other company. So if Progressive's number one and I get Progressive, that kind of makes me number one. Feels good to be a winner, huh, Ed? 
to insure your vehicles with the leader in truck insurance. Call your local independent agent or visit ProgressiveCommercial.com. United Financial Casualty Company and its affiliates Mayfield Village, Ohio. Available in most states. Market positions from Highline Data's 2007 written premium data. Member Michelle Bowman on the Sam's Club E-Values Savings Celebration. E-Values lets me sample extra savings on top of the values I already get at Sam's Club. March 9th through 13th, try E-Values, the money-saving benefit plus members enjoy all year, like $150 off select HP notebooks, $50 off select certain mattresses, even $1 off fresh strawberries, and much more. Not a member? Join now and sample E-Values. Sam's Club. Savings made simple. Supplies are limited and may not be available in all clubs. One item per membership, no rain checks. Large parts of Japanese coastal areas are underwater following the quake-triggered tsunami. ABC's Clarissa Ward has just reached the town of Sendai. There are large parts of at least the port and near the coastal area there that are completely submerged underwater. And obviously, it won't, you won't really understand or know the full scope of this devastation until that water starts to recede and we see what is underneath it. All 77 counties of Oklahoma are under a state of emergency. More than two dozen wildfires broke out across Oklahoma. Oklahoma. The outbreak spurred evacuations and destroyed at least 49 homes, 30 of them in the Oklahoma City suburb of Hera, where Fire Chief Morell Coleman says at first they couldn't get water. We lost power from the high lines and the transformers going out, so we lost power. Uh, my city has generators. They've hooked the wells up to generators, and uh, the wells right now are running off a generator. Some of Coleman's firefighters had to be treated for smoke inhalation and heat exhaustion. Richard Cantu, ABC News. Supper's over. President Obama spent his Saturday night attending the Gridiron Dinner here in Washington. It was the first time he's made an appearance at the annual event since he's been president. Media were not allowed to cover the event, even though the Gridiron consists of journalists. Every president since 1885, except Grover Cleveland, has addressed the club. The White House said the night would include song and dance and humor and perhaps a little embarrassment. Tamon Bradley, ABC News, the White House. This is ABC News. Trying to sell your old car? Instead, donate your vehicle to Heritage for the Blind. Pickup is free and your donation is tax deductible. Just call 1-800-895-8035. Heritage for the Blind accepts cars, vans, trucks, and boats, whether they run or not. Donate your vehicle and you'll receive a free three-day vacation voucher to over 50 locations. Call 1-800-895-8035. That's 1-800-895-8035. Chuck Severson, ABC News. Run! Save yourself! It's coming! Frankie, what's wrong with you? The April tax deadline, it's getting so close, and I haven't even started my paperwork. Oh, no. Pardon all the drama, but if you've waited until the last minute to do your taxes, there's a better alternative to pure panic. Just go to www.irs.gov, your reliable source for all things taxes. Get a grip, Frankie. We'll figure it out. But the forms, the math, it's terrifying. Ah! That's www.irs.gov, where you'll find all the information you need, like how to e-file your taxes so you don't miss that April deadline. All the forms are there, too, including the 4868, the one you need to file for an extension. See, Frankie? There is hope. We're going to make it. AM 1420, WBSM. Available anywhere and anytime at WBSM.com. Just one click gives you local news and weather, national and world news, business and entertainment news, and of course, sports. WBSM.com has the Pete Braley and Ken Pittman blogs, chances to save with half-price hookup and iBid, and even ways to win. One click does it all from anywhere at any time. WBSM.com. When I broke my neck in a diving accident over 40 years ago, people would approach my bedside in different ways. Hi, this is Johnny Erickson Tata, and some of my friends had a lot of good advice, but good as it was, their counsel went right over my head because I was too emotionally turned upside down to make heads or tails out of their well-meaning words. I'm sure the advice made great sense to them, and no doubt they were anxious to see a smile on my face or 
Want to see a happier attitude from me? But I was not ready for advice. I was still mourning. I was still grieving the loss of not having use of my hands or legs. I needed time to cry, time to think. And oh, how I appreciated those friends who did not come into my hospital to fix anything or fix me. Often they did not have any words to say. They just came to spend time with me. They cared. And from disabilitycampaign.org, let me say that you can care too. Elise, come on, it's game day. You've got all weekend to study. Jen, this has nothing to do with studying. I've got to work. The way the economy is, I figure I'll be working for the next century just to pay off these student loans. Well, you know... I know, I know. You joined the National Guard, so your college is completely paid for. Yes, you've mentioned it a couple thousand times. The National Guard scholarship covers up to 100% of your tuition. Learn more at nationalguard.com. Sponsored by the Massachusetts National Guard. Aired by the Massachusetts Broadcasters Association and this station. Newport Grand Slots is Rhode Island's new home for comedy. Saturday night, March 12th, see the one and only Kevin Meany. With an inspired blend of lunacy that includes physical humor, impersonations, stylized caricatures of nightclub singers, and his signature man-on-the-street interviews, Emmy Award winner Kevin Meany has been one of the country's most popular stand-up comedians for more than 25 years. Plus, also appearing, see the offbeat comedy of Carolyn Plummer. Showtime 8 p.m. Parking is free. Visit NewportGrand.com or call 401-608-6777. Newport Grand Slots. Friendly, fun, and oh so close at the base of the Newport Bridge. It's a wonderland at Newport Grand where it has to play. So play! I feel like it's all on my shoulders. How am I going to take care of my parents if they develop an eye disease like glaucoma? Glaucoma is the leading cause of blindness in African Americans and Hispanics in the United States. And what about my kids? Will they inherit it? Not to mention my risk factor. I'm really concerned and I need some answers. Call 1-800-437-2423 or go to ahaf.org for answers including a free brochure on glaucoma. My name is Tom Thornton. And my name is Cindy Thornton. We're retired, and this is how we live United. We decided to volunteer with United Way at our community free health clinic. United Way is how we contribute. Because we know our time and money are going to the right places. Judging by the thank yous we get at the clinic, I'd say we're doing the right thing with our retirement, too. We're Tom and Cindy Thornton. We volunteer at our community free health clinic. We don't just wear the shirt. We live it. Give. Advocate. Volunteer. Live United. Go to liveunited.org. Brought to you by United Way and the Ad Council. Hi, this is Scott Lang, Mayor of the City of New Bedford. Have you checked your medicine cabinet lately? You should. Every day, more than 2,500 teenagers abuse prescription medication for the first time. Sadly, teens often experiment with medications they find right at home. Many young people think it's safer to misuse prescription medications than illegal street drugs, but that simply is not true. Prescription medications can be beneficial when used under a doctor's supervision, but misusing medications can lead to addiction, overdose, and even death. Fortunately, there are steps you can take to help protect your children. Keep track of your medications. Encourage friends and relatives to safeguard medications in their homes. And consult your pharmacist about disposing of medications you no longer need. Remember, prescription drug abuse is still drug abuse. If you don't want your children to abuse prescription medications, don't give them the opportunity. A community service of New Bedford, the partnership for a drug-free America and the U.S. Conference of Mayors. To learn more, go to drugfree.org. That's right, boys. Spooky South Coast is back. I hate this. I like to torture him. I can smell your beard. I'm not afraid.
know the supernatural is something that isn't supposed to happen. All right, welcome back. Hour number two of Spooky South Coast. Tim Weisberg here, along with the silent assassin Matt Costa and science advisor Matt Moni, showing his Blue Oyster Cult tattoo to the Spooky TV audience, uh, which you can go to SpookySouthCoast.com and click on the Spooky TV logo and see the in-studio video for whatever reason you might want to do that. And jump in the chat room there with a bunch of our friends who are having a great time. And they're talking about, of course, our guest tonight, Tom Biscardi, and we're talking about not only his... Uh, career of investigating Bigfoot, but also the uh, 2008 hoax that was perpetrated by Matthew Witten and Rick Dyer, and we were talking a bit about that. Uh, bef before we jump back into the hoax, Tom, that, uh, that Witten and Dyer perpetrated here, uh, I do want to ask you one question. You mentioned in the first hour that you've had six encounters with the Bigfoot creature over the course of your career. I'm wondering if you could just describe to us maybe the closest or the best encounter that you've had with it. Hi, Tom. Tom, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, sorry, sorry, a little button issue here on our end. I was wondering if you could describe to us the best encounter that you've had uh, with a Bigfoot creature. I can. It, it sticks out in my mind like it was just yesterday, fellas. Uh, I was uh, up at Burning Mountain, a 4,500 feet elevation, and it was the day before air season opening up. And I was up at Ivan's. He has 40 acres up in Bernie, California, which a cabin that he built himself. <clears throat> Knew the land like the back of his hand up in that area. And uh, he wasn't feeling too good. He says, why don't you and Peggy go run the, the logging roads for any tracks? you got to understand now, I, I'm, this, this guy is, he mentored me. Uh, he was the pro. He's the he, he spoke, I listened to him. But she was pretty damn good, too. You know, she was great with, a, with her senses when it came to guiding the, the people. you got to understand something. Um, Ivan and Peggy Marks, were, they were a guide service. You know, uh, in other words, when bear season opened or cougar season opened or deer season opened, you would pay for their services and they would guarantee you a, a, a kill. So uh, he wasn't feeling well, and I was up there for beer season with him. And Peggy, why don't you and Tom go run the roads? This is like 5.30 early in the morning. We're running these logging roads where they cut them out. And they're going to take a bunch of lumber off the land. All of a sudden, I was still dew on the roads, still wet. So made it good for us. Now, on the rig that he had, he Jimmy rigged uh, some lights. Now, this is going back now to 1971, uh, many years ago. And uh, up in the front, he rigs a couple of lights going on each side of the road and, of course, in the back also. And uh, I'm driving, and there was a seat in the back of this rig, like an old bucket seat. And, uh, but it was looking backwards, because if I missed anything on the front, she could catch it on the back. <laughs> We're up about 4,500 feet elevation. Apparently, I miss it. She's banging on the, the rig, stop, stop, stop. So I stop the rig. I get out. I said, what's up? She says, you just passed uh, a bunch of tracks. We go walk, and here they are. Lo and behold, here's a, a large print, 19 inches long, and about uh, nine inches across the of the toes and four and a half on the heel. Wow. It's also break. And we go follow the tracks going into the, into the woods. And as we're getting in, we're about 150 yards in, and there was that smell one more time. Uh, sulfur type egg rotten 
egg smell, you know? And uh, all of a sudden, you see this big fur thing that was leaning over choke cherry bush. And we just stopped about 12 feet away from this thing, and it proceeds to get up, turns, and looks at us. It's got this choke cherry juice all over its mouth and the fur. You can see it. I'll never forget it. The, the eyes, when this thing looked at us, it looked like it was looking right through us and to say, who the hell are you and what are you here for? Mm -hmm. So Peggy, as brave as she was, she's just a little tight, five foot two. She's still alive, by the way. She's about, I think she's 87 now. God bless her. And uh, she's, with her hand, she's telling me back up slowly. We got back around 15, 20 feet. We turned around. She said, let's go. And we ran like hell, believe it or not. Never chased us. They never chased us. And we drove the rig down. And we got Ivan and the rest of the guys and got back up there. Of course, the thing had uh, wandered off somewhere else. But that was the, uh, the one that stands out in my mind the most because I'll never forget how that thing looked at me and her. Uh, and I think it'll go to my grave. Well, then I'll... The, I'm sorry, go ahead. That, but that was the one that sticks out the most in my mind. I was going to say, in all your experiences and in these encounters that you've had with them, does it seem like um, these creatures are aware of who human beings are and what human beings might mean to their existence? Great question. Great question, Tim. Yes. Yes. Uh, like I told you, I've had six encounters, and, and, you know, the thing that people don't realize about these things, uh, whether it be a, a race that's been undiscovered, whether it be uh, an unknown primate that slipped through the cracks, because of the terrain that they travel, the migrational routes that they travel each and every year, uh, and we're, we're, we're impeding on their lands, believe it or not, because... Throughout the years, I'm noticing it more and more now, and, and, and nobody, not the scientists, uh, the, the cryptozoology, self-proclaimed crypt, cryptozoologists and zoologists and, and all these scientific guys, uh, because in reality, you know, they, they write their, their theses and their books on people like me who's out there in the trenches finding all about these things, okay, where they should be instead of doing their paperwork on everything else. But that's okay. I don't care about that. What I do care about is these creatures, they know about us, okay? They know that we're impeding on their land. We know that they're, we're, we're impeding on their territories in, in which they, they habitate at the times, okay? Uh, but I don't, I don't think that they're afraid of us. As a matter of fact, I know they're not afraid of us. But... I'm not looking for any type of confrontation, although uh, when there's a, a, a young one of these creatures involved, which I've seen many times now, uh, they'll protect them to the nines, in which Paris, Texas, where uh, I had five teams out there, and one of the teams had encountered a small one, up in a tree, and the family members, because there's a family pot out there, had bombarded the team with a bunch of rocks. And um, my guys were scared. They, even though they were armed, they were scared. But here it was, self-defense situation where, you know, uh, here it is, the older, mature ones were protecting the young one. And... Uh, they know about humans. They know that we're out there and we're, we're sharing their lands. Well, uh, you mentioned uh, just a moment ago that your guys were armed, and that's a question that just popped up in the chat room. Is there wondering if you do carry weapons when you go out and investigate these creatures? Listen, the people that go out that tell you that they don't, they're full of crap, okay? Either that or they don't know what they're doing, and then they have no clue what's going on out there. It's strictly for self-defense. 
I don't care what anybody tells you. I mean, there's a lot of lunatics out there, and a lot of the places that I go that I don't know the people, and they they have guns, and 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 I tell them straight up, you know, you're you're not getting behind me. It's just you get in front of me. Because if you go off and get crazy, start shooting, you're shooting in front of me, and I don't want to be in in front of you because I don't know where the bullets are going to go. Uh, I I go with a bunch of professional guys. I'm, you know, we have tasers uh, that we've gotten. Uh, we yes, we do carry. Uh, I mean, don't you have to also be worried about the the creatures that we do know about that are going to be out there? Well, of course, there's bear, there's mountain lion out there, and you never know what you're going to run across. You know, I, I mean, I've been bitten twice by snakes for crying out loud. Besides. 362 chigger bites and ended up in the hospital three, three days in a row. Uh, but, you know, it's, it comes with the territory, fellas. I mean, that's what it's all about. But you're right, yeah. You know, I mean, uh, I've been to, to, to the tundra in Alaska with uh, grizzlies and uh, mountain lions in northern California and, and Arizona and uh, wild javelina and, and, and wild pigs and, and those of you, those of them out there that says, oh, no, you know, I can use a knife, you know, a toothpick or, or something to defend myself, they're, they're just dreaming, they're hallucinating. Uh, but, yeah, it, it, the real researchers and the real Bigfoot hunters that are out there in the, and I'm talking about in areas that's not inhabited by man, okay? I don't go out there taking people's money and bring them to national parks on weekends. That's not what I do, okay? I don't charge anybody anything. When I'm in somebody's territory, I invite everyone. And uh, to, to all your listeners can go out there and see it on BigfootLive.com and go to the media. There's 52 media releases there from all over the United States. I invite everybody out, wherever we are, whether it's the Everglades of, of Florida or to the Pacific Northwest, or in Michigan, the Upper Peninsula, or Minnesota, or Alabama, or in Texas, anywhere we go, okay? I in Montana on the on the reservations with the with the Blackfeet Indians. I, I have nothing to hide. And I tell I invite everyone. Listen, come on out. You'll see it as we see it when we see it. And then you know, I, I I I love to have them come out and and answer any questions that they may have, and they get a chance to see it as we see it also. Well, speaking of questions, we did get one via email from uh, Megan, and she wants to know if Bigfoot's bury their dead, and maybe that's why uh, hunters have never stumbled across a, a dead one, um, you know, a legitimate one. I'm not talking about uh, Dyer and Witten here, but, you know, is that why, you know, we haven't seen these animals just laying out in the, uh, out in the woods? Great question, Megan. And what I want you to do is go to searchingforbigfoot.com, go under the uh, index on the left-hand side, and go to Texas under the T's. And I'll say under there probably the greatest uh, discovery yet. We have a skeleton in Texas measured from head to toe, 108 inches. So do the math. And it was buried. And we did some carbon on it, and you'll see the whole story there. It tells it all. I even bought the thing. It cost me $8,000 to buy the, the skeleton. Next thing I go to find out, I, I desecrated Indian burial grounds. I don't know where these people think of this step up, you know, but uh, that's another one of your PhDs, by the way, Tim. And uh, don't know me. He's never met me. Doesn't even know where the hell I got the thing, but it's through my connections in Texas because I put Paris, Texas on the map outside of Paris. Guy got a hold of me. It's on his land. He owns the land. And he, he was excav excavating the, the land to put another house on it. And he ran across this skeleton. The next thing you know, the news comes out, Scardi is desecrating Indian burial grounds. Yeah, it's not the skeleton so, that's the story, no. <laughs> yeah? I said it's not the skeleton that they consider the story. Well, you see... What happens is, is they, they know that when Biscardi comes out on a on a site or on an encounter, something's going to happen. Okay, 
one way or another. Either it's going to be bogus or it's going to be the real deal, okay? I just happened to cut my my time, uh, and I know the shortcuts now, instead of sitting in, and engrossing a, a situation forever and ever and ever. I can normally get out to an area and within 15 minutes tell you if we've got the real deal or it's a bunch of crap. But to answer Megan's question, which is a great question, is yes, they do bury their dead. They're not cannibalistic. They don't eat their own. Yes, they do bury their own. So they they, they have like a ritual almost. Uh, they, they have the same observation uh, that, that human beings do for death. Well, I don't know if they sit there and pray over them and all the other stuff that goes along with it, mm-hmm. but I, I know that they do bury them because we found we found the skeleton of it, and uh, <laughs> we brought the, our finds to archaeologists and the archaeologists in the beginning say, oh, this is a true site. Now they're saying that the site doesn't even exist. So, you know, I'm a firm believer now, Tim and, and, and your associates there, that colleagues, that, you know, somebody's going to have to bring one of these things back one way or another, okay, whether it's dead or alive, and, uh, you know, just put it on top of the, the rig and run up and down Times Square and say, here it is, okay? And and you know, it seems like that's where you thought Witten and Dyer were heading with what they had discovered. You know, I'll tell you what, I really did. They were so cocky, so obstinate, and so sure of themselves, you know, I really thought... What they had in that ice chest was the real deal. And after I touched it and prodded it, and then when they came across and made the whole thing happen, I picked them up at the airport. Body was transferred. My team was satisfied that they had the real deal. They brought it to Indiana. These guys showed up. I picked them up, put them up at the hotel. We get on stage there. 218 or 223, I don't remember. (laughs) of the media people there. Streamed it all over the world. As you said, sites went down all over because there's so much traffic going on. My publicist, my PR guy, started the meeting off. Those of you seen it all over. Being streamed, then I came on and I introduced the boys. It was their heyday, not mine. It was their glory, not mine. They just used me as a, a unit to make it all happen. They got up there. They said their piece. After it was all said, you know, they all got interviewed, and I took those guys to dinner that night. It was around 7.15 at night. I get a call from Philip Morris. It's not the cigarettes. It's a guy down there in Carolinas who has a costume shop. Incidentally, that's the guy that sold the suit to Roger Patterson in the 1967 film for $435. No. And what you guys will be able to see all that in my next movie, Bigfoot Lives Too. <laughs> well, in any account, uh, he says to me, Tom, I want to give you an FYI because I don't want anything to happen to your partner. I said, what's that? He says, I know a guy who made the suit that was in that ice chest. I says, what? He says, yeah. I said, Really? I said, these guys are sitting out across the table from me. I said, tell them that. And I handed the phone over to, to Matt Whitten. Matt Whitten said, no, no, this is the real deal. We just transferred the, the body over to Tom's team, and uh, we've got the real deal here. He gives you the phone back. He said, I don't want you to get hurt, Tom. This was Phil, Philip Mars. I said, I appreciate the uh, FYI. I said, I'll get on it right now. Hang up the phone, and tell the guys and the people I was having dinner with, I excuse myself, I got to go to the restroom. Call my guys, and I said, look, put the turbo heater on that block of ice. I need to know what we've got for sure. Now. Now, said my dues, they went to bed. I went back to my home. 7, 7.05 in the morning, I get this phone call. To rub a foot. I says, you got to be kidding me. I uh, get dressed. I go down to the hotel. I call. I wake them up. Come on downstairs. We need to talk. I have this 
table, and I says, uh, the ice is melted. We got it melted. And uh, before I go any further, is there anything you want to tell me? He said, no. I said, it's a rub of foot. The head stooped down like dropped. He says, well, what do we do now? So I'll tell you what you do right now. I said, you give me my 50000 goddamn dollars. I said, back. I said, just sign a confession. I said, get out of my damn life. I said, I want nothing to do with you. Well, can't we work something out? No, we can't work nothing out. Not a damn thing. I said, where's my money? We spent it. I said, How do you spend money from 7 o'clock at night when the banks are closed to when you're in the, on the plane at 7 o'clock the next morning when the banks are not open? Well, we had obligations and yada, yada, yada. I said, I don't care about any of that. I want my 50000 now. He said, well, we got to do something. Can't we, can't, 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 we, can't we work something out? There's nothing to work out. I said, you're a ruse. You're, you're a phony, man. I said, I just can't believe that I believed in you guys and the stuff that you had, the stuff that I touched was real, but I don't know what you did. Next thing I know, I get my guys on the phone, and we're trying to get them to sign a confession and all this kind of crap. And Now, remember, though, during this whole thing that's going on, my videographer has the cameras rolling in Indiana the whole time this was happening. And when I had them on the phone, they had them on speaker phones, there when I had them in the room next to me in Palo Alto, California. Well, to make a long story short, they said, well, can't we work things out? And then that Steve Coles gets on the phone. Well, you know, I was on the same part of the law, the side of the law that you guys were locking people up for 20 years. We need to get our money back, whatever money you got left, and, and uh, we're going to go our way and you go your way. Well, you know, we signed a contract with Tom. Yeah, Tom's on the line. We just want our money back, and uh, uh, we don't want anything to do with you guys no more. So uh, they said, well, wait a minute. Let me let us talk. Him and uh, the other guy, Rick, they did some talk, and next thing you know, they hang up the phone. Go to find out that they fly east with the geese now because they were nowhere to be found. Well, I told my guys, as you get a hold of Fox News and the way we outed this thing, we come back and tell them the truth as we saw it, just the same way, mm -hmm. which we did. Uh, at that point in time, there was a guy down there on the radio station in South Carolina, I forget his name, called Speaking of Strange. He has a radio station. Maybe you remember him? Oh, yeah, Joshua Warren, yep. Joshua Warren, okay? He makes a deal with these guys to take the suit and auction it off on eBay. Well, they don't have the suit. We've got the suit. My guys dissected the body, and they go to find out that it's five different animals strategically placed inside this fur suit. Wow. The teeth that I touched, the tongue that I touched, it was real. It was of a donkey. The, the scrotum and the intestines, it was of a bull. The, uh, the eyeballs were of a pig. There was a full carcass of a 220-pound pig inside the body. So the bones that I touched, the, the, the meat and, and the body that I touched, was real. It was a macabre, disgusting situation of some sick minds that played it out. And when you see it, how they sewed the eyes into the sockets, how they saw, sewed the jaw bones and the teeth and the, and, the, and the tongue hanging out, okay, in that suit. And the decaying smell when they defrosted it all, all shown in the, in the, in the movie. And then to, to add insult to injury, here they auctioned this suit off that they didn't even have 
somebody bought it for $253,000, and we go to find out that that whole thing was a ruse also perpetrated by Witten and Dyer. That fell on, 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 on deaf ears with Joshua Warren also. Oh, wow. Which I, I just talked to Joshua a, a month ago, and he says, you know, he saw the movie. He says to me, you know what, Tom? I'm so sorry. The world owes you an apology, you and your guys. So that's the whole thing in a nutshell. And where are these two clowns today? Well, they flew out from the state for, for prosecution. They, they can't be found. Somebody says one of them's in Mexico and the other one's in Texas. We filed charges with the DA. And, uh, of course, Witten got fired, and the other guy took a powder. And uh, we never got around 50000 The 50000 has gone up to 107000 The time I had to pay payroll and transportation and expenses for everything, and it's up to about $107,000 today. I learned a big lesson, but you know what? Uh, life still goes on. We're getting pretty far in, the, in our research. The anatomy of Bigfoot hoax is done. Bigfoot lives, too, with some footage of, of the real creatures. Of the world will be able to see them. And my life story was picked up by Dick Clark Productions, and uh, uh, there's a movie in 3D that's going to be out this fall. And uh, Golden Leaf Pictures, your listeners can go to goldenleafpictures.com, and they can see the preview there. And then I have a reality show that's coming out in fall also. Nice. It's called In Search Of. So, you know, for every bad thing that happens, two good things, two or three good things come down the pike. I've uh, been doing this a long time. Uh, I know that we're getting closer, and I, I, we didn't get discouraged. It took the wind out of our sails there for a while, but that's okay. It's like a rubber ball, fellas. When you get knocked down hard, you bounce back up twice as high. Well, uh, I do want to say, though, I mean, hopefully with this Anatomy of a Bigfoot Hoax DVD, you can make back some of that money that they took from you. Uh, but also, hopefully, it, it enlightens people to understand, you know, just how much you can get wrapped up into the situation and, and how much, uh, you know, the quest to find this creature is so all-consuming for researchers such as yourself that... You know, sometimes you would never even, it wouldn't even enter into your mind sometimes that you might be being had because you've dedicated your life to this and you want to bring it to the world so badly. You know, Tim, <laughs> I, again, I have never met you, but wow, you are probably one of the most intelligent people I've ever spoken to. And i got to tell you something else. Can you call anyway, my wife tomorrow for me, Tom, and just let her know I, that? I'd be, I'd be more than happy. <laughs> I've got to tell you something. When I travel, I travel with guys that got very high IQs. I'm the dummy of the bunch, okay? But I've got guys that have IQs that are ranking, you know, 160 uh, and above, okay? I even got one that boasts of a, 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 hundred, uh, of a 217 IQ. I didn't even know they went up that high. But these guys are so smart. But when it comes to common sense, it's not there. But... These guys got fooled, okay, as much as I got fooled. And remember one thing, what goes around comes around, fellas. I'll tell you this, in all earnest, yeah, we got caught up in this hoopla, and we really believed we had the real deal. Every one of us did. It wasn't just myself. But where were all the other cryptozoologists? Where were all the other researchers? Where were all the other Bigfoot hunters? that wanted to know, that wanted to see was what was inside that ice chest. None of them got out there. There was one guy that went out there. It was me. It was my guys. Okay? But now they I have all... to ask you, though, does this make you gun-shy for, for the next time somebody calls you and claims that they have one? Listen, I've had, since then, I've had about six. And, and I've told them, here's what you do. I'll give you my FedEx number, chop off a finger, chop <laughs> off an arm, chop off a foot, send it to me first. 
after I go through the DNA of what you found, after you send me the photographs that you got where you've chopped it all off, we find out it's the real deal, then I'll fly out to see you. Otherwise, don't waste my time. I got to tell you this, though, and you can use this for another show because I'm going to have to go here in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. I got something that's working in Arkansas right now that's going to blow the world's mind, okay? Let me just put it to you that way. It will blow the world's mind. I have photos. I have documentation of something that's going on by our own government that will blow everyone's mind. Mind. Wow. Let's go to the CIA to the FBI. I've got the documentation. And I've got the pictures where these creatures were captured, and they they made hybrids of them. And some of them got loose. That's all I'm going to tell you. They hired some people to go capture them. And they couldn't. They killed them. And I've got the pictures and everything, and all the documentation of it. We'll save that for another show. Sure, and we'd love to have you come back and talk about Bigfoot Lives, too, when that comes out as well. But the uh, the DVD that's out right now is Anatomy of a Bigfoot Hoax, and you can get that on BigfootLives.com and uh, searchingforbigfoot.com as well. And, Tom, just do me a favor. Next time you need to have some DNA sequencing done, call Moniz for us before you spend $1,500 on, uh, on somebody else's DNA sample. So. No, I will, and I'll tell Matt that I'll take him up on that offer next time we do it. matter of fact, I just sent some some other DNA from the stuff that we got from uh, uh, Texas and Frost, Texas. The listeners might want to go to there. It's on the home page there. It was on our expedition in November of last year. You'll see what we have encountered. It's pretty compelling evidence. Fellas, God bless you. Thank you so much for having me on. Let's, let's make this year be a prosperous new year and, and a year that we bring, the, bring an end to this whole subject, okay? Sounds good. Thank you very much. Be well. You too. That is Tom Biscardi, the Bigfoot Hunter, and you can go to his websites, BigfootLives.com and searching for Bigfoot.com. And uh, it was really good to get the inside story from his perspective, especially since, you know, when everything went down, because Tom had been wrapped up in some other hoaxes in the past, you know, he was automatically lumped in with these guys, Witten and Dyer. And it's good that he's getting his story out, and uh, hopefully people pick up the DVD and they can get a chance to see it and decide for themselves. But uh, we're going to take a break right now. And when we come back, we're going to have our old friend, our content director, my hero in life, Christopher Balzano, will be joining us to talk about something new we have coming up for the listeners to participate in. Uh, and you're not going to want to miss this, especially if you're a longtime Spooky South Coast fan or if you've got all the archives and you've gone to the archives and you've listened to all the old shows. This is where we're really going to pick your brain a little bit. Uh, and not only is it a chance for you to win stuff, but it's a chance for us to learn a little bit about ourselves in the process. So stay tuned. We'll be right back with more here on Spooky South Coast. WBSM presents The Garden Guys, Sunday morning at 7. What to plant and when to plant it. Flowers, vegetable gardens, plants, and your lawn. Help for all your outdoor needs. The Garden Guys, Sunday mornings from 7 till 9 on AM 1420 WBSM. In the beloved fairy tale classic, Beauty and the Beast, Belle is imprisoned in the castle of a mysterious beast. But with the assistance of the castle's enchanted staff, the two become unlikely friends, discover that true beauty is found within, and they live happily ever after. Today, our happily ever afters are being threatened by the fact that nearly one in three children in America are overweight or obese. Now more than ever, it's time to make good nutrition and physical activity part of your family's daily lifestyle. Do things like eat dinner together, add fruits and veggies to every meal, save treats for special occasions, and get up and play an hour each day. 
Be our guest to healthy living and visit letsmove.gov to learn more. That's letsmove.gov. This message has been brought to you by Let's Move, the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Ad Council. What if your brother or your husband, what if your son came back from the service with a spinal cord injury? When they volunteer to serve, we expect our country to be there for them if they are injured. For more than 60 years, Paralyzed Veterans of America has been fighting to ensure that we receive all of the benefits that we've earned. Thank you, Paralyzed Veterans, for helping my husband. My son. For helping my brother. You too can help. Visit pda.org, a public service of Paralyzed Veterans of America. For America's wounded warriors, Coming home can sometimes be a battle in itself. Making the transition back to civilian life or active duty with a traumatic injury can be the challenge of a lifetime. The USO provides every American a way to support our wounded warriors and their families through every phase of their medical treatment and rehabilitation. It's how all of us, as a community, can give something back to our heroes. It's how we can say thank you and assure them that their sacrifice is recognized and appreciated by every one of us. Join us. Visit USO.org to learn how you can make a difference in the lives of our wounded warriors and their families. The USO, until everyone comes home. It's funny, isn't it, how everybody in town's afraid of you? What's gonna happen tomorrow is gonna happen, and all your worry in the world isn't gonna change that. Spooky South Coast is back. All right, welcome back to Spooky South Coast, Tim Weisberg, along with the silent assassin Matt Costa and science advisor Matt Moniz, who, contrary to popular belief, was not in the freezer. No. It just was his beard along with some other animal entrails. But uh, <laughs> first, I, in a serious note, I do want to say uh, best wishes to uh, all of our listeners in Japan and in Hawaii and, and wherever uh, the earthquake and the tsunami affected because we actually do have audience out there. So uh, hopefully everybody's okay. And please touch base with me, Tim, at SpookySouthCoast.com uh, to let me know that everything's okay. And, uh, and our friends from TAPS were out there filming, too. Every, yeah. And as far as you know, everything's cool. Everybody's all right. As you, I just showed you, I got a yep. uh, text from Jason saying all is okay. Thankfully, Hawaii was, was spared anything really serious. So, uh, But our thoughts and well wishes go out to all of those affected by that tragedy. And now following up on that, Chris Balzano. <laughs> uh, you love how I just throw you under the bus like that, Chris. <laughs> you know? Hey, Bob, by the way, you know, thank you for – for being uh, an open mic for opinions and, and ideas that might not uh, always get out there and be able to be expressed. Uh, pleasure being to doing business with you guys. Well, same here, and uh, it's it's you that brought us Tom Biscardi too. So uh, it's a it, whenever we have these opportunities, you know. And for those who don't know, a little bit of inside the show here. Uh, I used to like respond to all the emails and everything when people wanted to come on the show. Now, when I get them, I just forward them on to Chris and say, "Make it happen." And he does. He does where I never could. So that's uh, – you deserve all the credit for that. So, uh, Or blame. Okay. Excellent Either way. job. And, yes. and, and now yes. you're sitting there in your free time. In addition to doing all this work for us and writing books and working your job and taking care of your family, now you're sitting around and having ideas about how to, uh, how to get the spooky South Coast invo uh, audience involved here in the show. Yeah. Well, you know, the idea came to me as I was uh, – Thinking about some of the guests we had had uh, as I'm doing research for something that I'm working on right now, and I was like, oh, I, well, man, I couldn't remember the, 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 the guest's name, and I, I tried doing, you know, we have a great search engine that helps find things, but I, I couldn't find what I was looking for. I eventually did, and I was thinking, wouldn't it be great if we had stylized pages, if we had kind of like um, theme-based pages where people could go and they could find things out based on subject matter, based on guests, and kind of basically have pages that were dedicated to some of the things. We've got, you know, this this Friday is actually my five-year anniversary of when I first appeared on the show, which is why I put myself up there as the uh, classic audio this week. Well, happy anniversary. But, um, so thank you very much. I consider Spooky South Coast not having started until I got on my first show. So um, I would agree I with that. Like, 
I know so many people there have like a quick reference. Some, so many of our fans have a quick reference to a show that they used to like or, or something like that. And so what I thought we would do is we would set up some pages where basically uh, the page is dedicated to either a certain person or a certain uh, idea or a concept that we've covered on the show. And so if people, for example, wanted to hear the, the five best Tom Diagostino shows, they could go on there and they could click right on that page and, you know, listen to that and download the whole thing and kind of take it for the week. Or if people wanted to find out some of the best things we've done on Urban Legends or, or something like that, once again, boom, a page dedicated to it. So they'd have that as like a resource. And so what I thought was, because our, our regular listeners are so intelligent and kind of have, are so passionate about things that they've liked on the show, that we would open this kind of theme page to them as well. So what we're looking to do is invite listeners to comb the archives, come up with a theme for your page, find the shows that kind of fit that theme, and send them to us. And what we're going to do is we're going to, as we kind of do this project, which is probably going to take us a, you know, at least a month to kind of do this, this whole idea through to the end, we'll kind of pick the one that kind of suits us the best, kind of the one that, that, that really is the one we think a lot of people are going to go to, and uh, offer them a prize. Uh, we know we have the uh, Coral Castle books that are going to be coming that we can give away. We're, we haven't exactly thought of exactly what we're going to do to uh, pay them back, but they'll definitely get the publicity uh, for them or even just for their website on that page itself. But, you know, this is something that we really want the listeners to get involved in as well. Well, T-shirts and bumper stickers are a sure thing, and I'll throw in a copy of Ghosts of the South Coast. Yeah, I'm not giving away any of my stuff for free, though. <laughs> Well, as long as I have as long as I have copies, it goes to the South Coast because they're not going to send me any more until I pay the bills. <laughs> exactly, and I'm not paying your bills either. So you know, I, I just like, especially when you know we're in the chat room and there seems to be a, a community, a solid community that's there every week, and there's a, a community that you know responds to things via email or via Facebook. That I thought, hey, listen, you design kind of like a mock show, and and I and it's even I think going to be able to go like one step further where. I'll, where, you know, for people who want, we can even burn that theme, uh, sell it at a really discounted price. If you wanted to give it to someone, you want them to have kind of the best information on one topic, boom, there you go, here's a CD. Um, so we haven't set the price for it and stuff like that, probably much, not much more than the, than the shipping and the, and the cost for us to do it. But it'll be, at least, that... it'll be at least the same price as a Time Life collection. And it will probably be a lot less than the Inside the Bridgewater Triangle uh, <laughs> <laughs> CD from from John Horgan. So. We, we can throw some of those in the prize package too. I think, which is a quality product if people want to go uh, onto my site and uh, and uh, purchase that. But um, so yeah, so you know, please call the archives. Like get a show together. It can be based on any theme that's inside of your head. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a guest or or an idea. Something that you think represents something that we do well, or something that the guests, more importantly, have done well. Um, and then you can email that to us at SpookyCrew at SpookySouthCoast.com or uh, to Tim or I at, or, or Matt or the Matt, either of the Matt's at their email addresses or, you know, even post it on Facebook. And, uh, and we'll respond to you and we'll get those up ASAP. I, I'm guessing here that, uh, and this is just my own uh, self-glory here, but I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of people in, the, in their top five favorite episodes, the Backyard Podcast episode is going to pop up on more than a few lists. And let me guess, the background for that is going to be like the Animal House theme? <laughs> <laughs> it was... Yeah, or even, yeah, even like, I mean, that, that's because that's a, you know, if you really want to find, you know, the, the, the five or six episodes we or you guys have done outside of the studio, which are some really quality episodes, be it the Backyard Barbecue or the the Lizzie Borden house one, um, that's, 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 boom, there's a theme right there, you know, so people can kind of see the, the behind and the, 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 the one where you guys were interviewed. Um, so that's all quality stuff. So if it was all together in one place, someone could be like, oh, I want my, you know, my funny spooky South Coast night and click on. And, uh, and, and Dave in the chat room, Low Battery Dave, just mentioned that one of his favorites is the, the uh, live radio drama that we did in the studio. And I remember, Chris, when you emailed me the idea, I said, for all the great guests we've had, for all the great shows that I think that we've done over the past, uh, the past five years, I can, I can retire today knowing that we put on that live radio drama and knowing that we did the War of the World hoax. And I think our place in the National Broadcasting Hall of Fame is secure. <laughs> <laughs> well, especially if 
you respond to what's being offered on Spooky TV and get that degree in radio. So Yeah, I keep seeing it pop up there. I think I'm going to click on it after the show. <laughs> I wonder how many... But yeah, so, so the call's being put out, and we want to, you know, want to see... And, of course, you know, we would love to see you encourage uh, your friends to also do the same thing if they've liked the show or they've liked a certain episode and... You know, see if we can kind of jam up that search engine that we have and see if we can get some kind of things going. And the really cool thing is that then that offers us, you know, if, if a listener wants to check things by theme, all they have to do is search and they're going to be able to come up right with those pages. So. And, and not only that, though, but getting these lists back is going to give us an idea of what topics people like to hear about and give us an idea of, of where to bring the show in the future. Of course. And that's the ultimate thing. The, the, the site that gets the most traffic will have the, uh, the you know, the six-month award for – being the one that the people seem to like the most. So, and, uh, and and if you have friends who aren't Spooky South Coast fans, you can just direct them to a page that you know that they would be interested in. Let them listen to those five five shows on that topic, and who knows, maybe we'll have a new lifelong fan. You know, I know because that was actually uh, you know, and I'm not just saying this because I'm I'm part of the crew, but when I I just recently for Christmas got my first iPod, and one of the first things I did was oh, I downloaded the nineties. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I downloaded like seven shows. Or were all ones that I had missed or um, ones that were, like, old ones. That I, and they all had, this, uh, like, a running theme to them. And I just kind of noticed it after the fact. And so it was it was like, oh, wow, I've made, like, a little best of show. There you go. All right, well, we are just about out of time. But uh, make sure that you put together those lists and email them to us, SpookyCrew at SpookySouthCoast.com. And uh, we'll come up with a, a cool prize pack to give you in return if you are the winner. And if not, hey, you're helping to spread the spooky word. So... Just consider it uh, a favor to us. We appreciate it. We appreciate all of you for listening each and every week. We'll be back next week. Right, Chris? We're going to be talking about the Bridgewater Triangle. Uh, not our big investigation show, but we're going to be talking about some of the history and some of the research that uh, a team, a local team has been doing. Uh, so I'm, I'm really excited for that. And uh, we'll be back with that next Saturday night. No college basketball, so don't worry about that. Just have to keep an eye on the Bruins and the Red Sox going forward. So... Uh, until next week, for Matt Moniz, for Matt Costa, for Chris Balzano, I'm Tim Weisberg, and we want you all to stay spooktacular. Hear all the action from the garden and from on the road. Bruins Hockey, presented by Southern Mass Credit Union, Paul and Dixon Insurance, and by Gary's Best Hot Dog on AM 1420, First, local news, WBSM and Sports. This is WBSM New Bedford, Citadel Broadcasting, AM 1420, WBSM. I'm Hilary Barsky. Cooling systems have failed at yet another nuclear reactor on Japan's earthquake and tsunami devastated coast with conflicting reports of a partial meltdown underway. ABC's Christian Amanpour is in Tokyo and says there are growing concerns about how the Japanese government is dealing with the situation. While people here are trying to come to grips with what this nuclear meltdown or potential meltdown might mean, there is an increasing sense of fear and an increasing sense that the Japanese authorities have not fully divulged the full extent of what's happened and what the danger may really be. ABC's Alex Stone is in Tokyo, and he has an update from Pentagon officials on their efforts to assist Japan with its nuclear emergency. Help is coming this way from the U.S. Two nuclear experts are expected to be here on Sunday, coming in from Washington, and two U.S. aircraft carriers are on their way here, says Defense Secretary Robert Gates. Those two ships can be used for helicopter operations and the humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. That relief desperately needed. There have been reports of hundreds of people possibly being exposed to radiation. It's become extremely serious here. Alex Stone, ABC News, Tokyo. Nine evacuees have tested positive for radiation exposure, but officials say they show no health problems. A casino bus crash in New York City on Saturday that killed 14 people and seriously injured eight others may have been caused by the driver falling asleep rather than, as he told police, a tractor trailer hitting the bus. ABC's Richard Esposito has more on the investigation. While police initially accepted the driver's claim, they want to remind us at this time that his claim was his alone and not supported independently. So now they're looking into these other possibilities that the driver's own errors may have caused the crash. Arab nations have moved further to isolate Muammar Gaddafi's regime. The Arab League has asked the UN Security Council to impose